Hi everyone, welcome back. My name is Michelle. I'm Mama Loves You GB here on FlossTube, but also on Instagram and Etsy. So do come and check me out over there. It is Sunday the 6th of September today. Um, this is a channel primarily about cross stitch, although you may see the odd other thing. Um, I can knit, I can sew, but I can't crochet. As far as I'm concerned, that is a dark art. How you produce anything from one single strand and one stick, I have no idea. I have no idea. Um, it's been an interesting week. We've been back at school this week. I'm a secondary school science teacher. Um, and so we've had a few days without the students and we've started to get some students back in now. So um, that's been interesting. They've been really, really good. Um, in Wales, the regulations are that they need to wear masks and staff need to wear masks in communal areas like um, corridors where social distancing isn't in uh, isn't possible um, but in the classroom we just have to stay at the front and then if we have to approach the children then we need to put masks on and they put their mask on um, and we go from there. Um, toilet breaks going to be interesting my classroom is not too far from a toilet so I in the past I have been able to just nip out if I've needed to but just nipping out involves going all the way around the one-way system so I'm gonna have to get some serious bladder control going um, and this is pretty much going to be my uniform for the foreseeable. I got fed up taking the mask on and off. Um, it just became too difficult. So that's what I've gone for. I'm just going to wear that all the time. The kids can see my face. They can see when I'm happy. They can see when I'm sad. They can see when I'm cross. They need to know all of those things. So as we get more students back next week, um, we'll have to see how it goes. Everyone's just got to learn and get used to the new situation. Um, just want to say some massive thank yous. Uh, thank you to all of you who've liked and subscribed so far. I've had two videos out and I've got over 500 subscribers already and the videos have been viewed over a thousand times each so I'm really really pleased about that. I'm hoping that people who are watching are getting something useful from it and that they can um, learn something new, see new patterns etc etc. I've got so much to show you today. Um, also want to thank you to those who've given me shout outs in the last week, uh, made by Michelle McGraw and um, Amy from Gable Stitcher. Uh, they both gave me lovely shout outs and said that they did how much they would enjoyed my, my whip parade particularly. So thank you very much to them. So what have I got to show you today? I have got one finish. I have got two uh, FFOs. I've got some sampler September things to show you and I've also got some dyeing to talk about. One of the questions or certainly the, the topic of the questions that I get asked um, in the comments and people who contact me through, through Instagram is about dyeing. So um, I actually bought a new type of dye this week and I've done some little tests. It all got a little bit sciencey uh, yesterday and the day before so I've done some little tests, changed a few variables and so you'll be able to see what difference it makes to your dyeing if you fancy having a go. So um, first thing I'm going to show you is my finish and this is my finish. This was whip number 39 actually last week um, this is Perfect Pumpkins by Owl Forest Embroidery and it's stitched on 32 count sparrow um, by a dyer on Instagram called Foxglove and Lace uh, and as I said last time her linens are beautiful and I absolutely adored this colour and just picking out my own flosses just to reflect really what's going on in, our, in my garden. Um, my other half is big into growing vegetables and particularly um, heritage vegetables. Um, so we've got all sorts of weird and wonderful tomatoes, Voyager tomatoes, um, some kind of Russian tomato, um, all sorts of different squashes and um, courgettes, all sorts of crazy things going on in the garden. So lots of them are brightly coloured. These were my flosses that I picked out. Um, I've got some in here that are Weeks Dye Works, some which are Victorian Motto, um, others from the Gentle Art. The Gentle Art Tomato has to be one of my favourites of all time. I love that one. And 
I've started to think about how I'm going to finish it. I want to finish it off as a little pillow, but I painted this. I bought this from TK Maxx in the kitchen section and it was just one of their sort of teak, I guess it's like a little table basket for rolls, for whatever cutlery that you want to put on the table. Uh, and I painted it black with um, just acrylic paint and I've sanded back the edges a little bit just to make it look a little bit distressed. I haven't done a, look, a lot, I just want it distressed, not panic stricken. Um, and so my idea is that I'm going to make that into, let's see if I can make it sort of half, half sit so you can see roughly what it's going to look like. So I'm going to make it into a little pillow and it's going to sit in the bottom there. So I'm really, really pleased with that. So that's my finish. Put that down there. Um, my FFOs, I've been doing a little bit of framing. Um, I think I said to you a couple of weeks ago, I went to uh, my favorite framers in the Cotswolds in Stone the World, and I picked out some frames um, to fit pieces that I'd already got. And so I framed those um, myself. The first one I'm gonna show you is this one, which is one of the loose spread feathers, the out of print uh, Blackbird designs, although lots of them are getting reprinted at the moment. Um, so you never know about this one. This one may came back, come back in. It's called Their Song. Um, absolutely love doing this one. The, the threads, I believe, are the called for. They might not be all in quite the called for places, especially down here. Um, just because I was getting towards the end of a couple of skeins and I didn't have a second one. So I just changed it around a little bit, but not so much that you've noticed. And it is on, I believe, 32 count Wren. Let me just check there, so. Sorry, 32 count Legacy. 32 count Legacy. Um, and if you stitch it on 32 count, it gives you this frame, which is um, a standard 8 by 10 if you frame it quite close in, which I'm quite happy to do. It's not got any glass on it. Um, it's, it's framed using foam core and then pinned. Um, I watched a video by Elizabeth Ann Can Stitch about how she frames her things, um, wanting to look at it really to, um, to see if she had a better way of doing it. And what I found out was that she frames in exactly the same way that I do, um, which is to cut my mat board or cut my foam core, core board to the right size to sort of centrally put the design on and then just start pinning and then stretching and pinning and stretching and pinning. And it's just a continuous process. Um, I pretty much watched an entire episode of the Joyfield Stitcher this morning um, doing these two. So, so don't expect to do anything quickly with it. Um, the back is just one of those um, sort of stand-up type, type frames. But I frame in the same way as her in the fact that there's probably quite a bit of extra fabric just tucked behind there. And as far as I'm concerned, if it fits under the frame, it can stay there. Um, you never know when you might want to do something different. And so um, keep it there, just in case. You might want to frame it again with a slightly bigger frame. You never know. So last look at that one. Hi, sorry about that little interruption. So the second one that I framed this morning was um, a Welsh sampler from a chart that I'd got from the um, Sampler and Antique Needlework Quarterly magazine. Um, and it's Anne Davis. And this is the picture that was in the magazine. Excuse me, it's a really, really poor printout. And you can see that the um, magazine conversion has got purples and all sorts of other different colours in it. And I wasn't so keen actually on the conversion. I really liked the picture of the sampler, um, the old sampler that they'd shown. And so I did mine to match the colours more closely from the, um, the historic sampler. So I think maybe I've mentioned to you before, Capel Isaac is in Carmarthenshire, it's about 15, 20 miles from, from where I am, and the 28th of July here is my birthday. Now, I'm not entirely sure this one's sitting completely straight in the frame, 
I may go back and just have another bit of a stretch and repin, although my piece of fabric here, which was a 36 count um, summer khaki, which I've done two over two, the whole piece of fabric seemed to be a little bit off kilter, so that may be the best I can, I can get it. Um, so this is a frame that I picked up from the framers in Stow on the Wold. Um, it just happened to fit really well. I don't know if I'd necessarily have gone for something quite so heavy as this, but um, that, that's the choice that I made between framing it myself and buying a, a frame that happened to fit or getting them to frame it, which would have then been, quite rightly so, um, quite a lot more expensive. Um, the Sampler and Antique Needlework Quarterly magazine is what I'm going to have a chat with you about um, when we talk about Sampler September. So um, it's Sampler September if you are doing a sort of a newly designed sampler and uh, September Sampler Soiree if you're doing something which is a reproduction. So this one would come under the, under the soiree because it's a reproduction sampler. Um, I really, really enjoyed stitching this one and I just love particularly that vibrant red love how it's come out. It's a mixture of DMC and also um, some fancy floss there. So that's my um, my finish and my couple of FFOs for, uh, for this week. My stitching, I picked a sampler that I really wanted to work on as part of my sampler September and this one is Mary Clayton by Hands Across the Sea and I'm stitching it on 36 count fabric that I hand dyed myself in a sort of similar colour to the to the picture. Now I didn't give this one an iron because I was literally stitching on it this morning um, but I haven't got much else done. I've got started on the text and then a couple of those motifs down there in the corner. Now I'm hoping to get this finished this month. This is the piece that I want to really focus on and get finished this month. So there we are. Really really love stitching on this one. The charts are always brilliant. Nicola does such a fantastic job with those charts and it's a pleasure, absolute pleasure to stitch on. Okay, now, Friday morning, I had absolutely no plans at all to start a long dog sampler. None at all. By Friday night, I'd started a long dog sampler. They released a new one um, on Friday morning, which happened to just pop up on my Instagram. I swear, Instagram is the thief of my bank account. Um, and if you haven't seen it, it's the sort of follow on from Pandemic and it's called The New Normal. And the idea, if you read what they've written about it, what Julie's written about it on um, the website, this is the bubbles. These are the bubbles that we now form with our friends and family and our co-workers and those people closest to us that we come into contact with us. And I started to look at the chart and the more I looked, the more I saw. And I actually restricted myself just to looking. When I realized that I restricted myself just to looking at that top corner because I wanted to find the things as I'm stitching them now. Um, so yeah, printed it off bought it, printed it off. I've actually put it into um, Pattern Keeper as well. Um, I got Pattern Keeper fairly recently. This is my tablet that I use for Pattern Keeper. It's just a little eight inch Android tablet because I didn't have anything Android that would have um, that would have taken it. I know they're working on an iOS one but um, it's not there yet. So there it is, fingerprints and all. Um, fair play to anyone who has ever stitched a long dog without the aid of Pattern Keeper. I wouldn't, I'd have been lost by now. So I'm stitching it on 40 count French lace by Witchelt. And 
as I said, I've started just up in the top left corner and you've got the elephant so far. That's my only full animal that I found. And I am stitching it using a hank of silks for you. Got a long tail there. A hank of silks for you in navy blue and I'll have to put the colour up across the bottom because I can't quite remember what it is. Now the silks for you hanks come obviously in a big long loop and what I've been doing up until this point is just looping them as you would a normal floss like that just looping the whole hank over a coat hanger and what I decided to do with this one I'd seen somebody else do it and I thought oh I'm going to try that was to plait it. So I cut it into um, this sort of length, okay, which I think I cut it in half, so I've got one long piece and I cut it in half again and then I plaited it from there. And what you can do is you can pull out just one single thread and the rest of it stays plaited. So these bits that I've got sort of tails hanging here, they're the, the threads that I'm working on pulling a thread out at a time. And it stops it getting knotted and it stops it um, getting all sort of scraggedy anny. And this is sort of the perfect length really for me for stitching. So yeah, that was Friday. Um, total squirrel, total just, I'm starting that. It's brilliant, I'm starting that. And then the other thing that I worked on this week is my favourite, which is Barbara Anna Santa's Trips, part five has been released. And when I posted it on Instagram, I noticed I hadn't quite finished the corner there. Guess what? I still haven't finished the corner there. But if you look at the pattern, it'll have another corner sat next to it next month. And so I'll just do it then when I get the green out. So I love this one. I can't wait to get this one finished and framed. I think it's so beautiful. Um, there is some snowflakes that I haven't done on there, but I think I'm going to do some beads on, so I'm going to leave that to the end to make that decision. But yeah, The Adventures of Mr and Mrs Santa. Lovely. So that really is my stitching this week. I didn't expect to be doing a massive amount. I didn't expect to start a long dog. Um, but I didn't expect to be doing a massive amount of going back to school and everything. So um, I'm pretty pleased pretty pleased with what I've what I've done so far. Okay so as I said in uh, honour of uh, September, uh, sample of September or um, or the soiree what I've done is I've found some charts that I want to share with you that are very much on my radar and they are all from Sampler and Antique Needlework Quarterly magazine. Now, Sampler and Antique Needlework Quarterly magazine actually finished in 2015, I think it was. Started in 1991 and finished in 2015 after 80 um, issues. And you can still buy the issues um, individually, places like eBay um, and, and stash and load, they crop up. But you can also buy a CD-ROM, which has got every single issue on it. And I've got that, and I'll have to put a picture of it up here because that's the one thing I did forget to bring up, was the actual CD-ROM itself. Um, so it's got all of them in PDF format. So it's the whole magazine, it's not just the individual charts, but it's the whole magazine so you can find out lots of information about, the, about samplers, about needlework in general, the history, techniques, all sorts of things. And there are hundreds of charts. Now I had a quick look this morning, um, just on Amazon, and at the moment the CD-ROM on Amazon is £38 on Prime um, in the UK. I don't know about the States. Sometimes it crops up on eBay, um, sometimes I've seen it on Stash Unload, but I'm going to show you some charts because I think that it's an absolute bargain. If you get a chance to get it, I really, really would recommend it because you can obviously either work from the PDF or you can print off what you want and stitch from there. Um, 
so many of the charts that were first in the magazine have been subsequently printed um, and actually I've found that I've bought charts that were technically already on my CD-ROM had I known. Um, so what I'm going to do is show you, I've picked out um, I think eight or nine just ones that I really really love that I'd really like to get started sooner rather than later. So here is my pile. Now I'll start with one which shows exactly what I was just illustrating. So this is the Susan Rambo sampler. Now there are actually two Susan Rambo samplers in on the CD-ROM. This one obviously and another one. Um, by the same girl, so those, for those of you who like pairs of samplers, there is a paired sampler there to stitch. Now what drew me to this is the border. Now I actually bought this chart before I realised it was on the CD-ROM. Excuse the glare on this one. Now this chart I think if I remember rightly came from Australia and it was already on the CD-ROM. But you can maybe see a little bit more clearly there. So that is the chart that's been released um, by Crosspoint Designs. And then I've just printed out the cover of this one. That is the chart, or that is the original that is in the Sampler and Antique Needlework Quarterly magazine. So I'd love to do that one. Absolutely love to do that one. Um, the next one is a really, really simple one, but one that I think is elegant. Now, I've got a mind that I've seen this somewhere since. So I'm not 100% sure if it has been reprinted or, or released as an actual chart. If anybody knows, then do, do drop me a comment. This is Maria Dale, 1835. Now, I would probably stitch this in black or something similar, maybe one of the, one of the lovely Gloriana blacks. Um, it's charted, I'm trying not to show the chart, in DMC 500. So it's a very, very dark green. But I think that is lovely. And it says, if the spring put forth no blossom, in summer there would be no beauty, and in autumn no fruit. If youth be idle, mature years will be miserable. Remember that. If you're idle in the youth, you will be miserable in your older dotage. We shall see. I love that one. And the charts in the magazines are absolutely beautiful. They're really, really easy to follow. Um, they are black and white, but really, really lovely. Um, a second one that I liked, and I have got the kit for, is this one, Anna Thies. That's how you say. Um, 1859. Now, that cat... That bird, I absolutely love. I'm not a cat person. Something else I've got to show you afterwards is a, is a cat, but I'm not a cat person. But I keep seeing cats on things and liking them. Um, I think I like them in pictures better than I like them in actuality. <laughs> so, this one I picked up on like a stash and load website. and it's released by Perman of Copenhagen. So same chart, now just released and available to buy now that it's out of the magazine. And I can grab them. Oops. Oh. They're properly tied down. Let's do it that way. There we go. Those are the colours, greens, reds, burgundies, beautiful. I really had to stop myself the, the day I got this in the post, I really had to stop myself starting it. Probably shouldn't, but I did. And it also came with this fabric, which is obviously a permanent of Copenhagen fabric, so it could stand up and walk out the door. But I don't mind that being an in-hand stitcher, don't mind it. Oops. 
I've got threads being naughty here. Okay, a couple of others. This one, let's see whether they put a picture of the actual stitch. No, just the original. This is Ellen O'Brien, 1838. And so many beautiful motifs there. Love this border at the top here. And then stylized trees, a couple of cool little rabbits there, definitely on their way to somewhere. Don't know quite where, but they're on their way to somewhere. Um, and age 13. And you, when you look through the charts in the, mag, in the magazine or the CD-ROM, you always get some information about where they've come from, where they currently are, whether they're in a museum or in a private collection. Um, it's really interesting to sort of see because then you start to get to learn um, typical motifs from certain areas, um, certain time periods as well. This one is called Lydia Ann Sharp, 1848. And I really like these trees here. To my mind, they're sort of willow trees. And that sort of border that goes around the outside. I'm a sucker for a border. I love them. And then it says, this work of mine my friends may have when I am in my silent grave for them to read and look upon and think of me when I am gone. So... That was her sentiment there. Okay, now this one, um, Brenda and Laura showed in their video on Sunday and it's long been on my um, to start list. In fact, I've got the fabric for this one. Um, I've probably got the floss as well somewhere along the line. This is Isabella, Isabella Johnston, 1858, and that cow. It's all about the cow there, isn't it? And this alphabet here, I like them. I like the alphabets when you have to go and have a closer look. So if it's on your wall and you've got an alphabet there or a motif or something like that, I like there to be something in the... Um, chart in the actual stitch that means that you get to see more if you go closer and that is there that ghost alphabet Lovely. okay just a couple more I'm going to save that one for last because that one's my favourite now this one I'm sure I've seen uh, available as an individual chart as well. This one, Margaret Jane Ledbetter, 1846. And this has got this big Solomon's Temple um, there. Now, um, I've got a lot of love for my other Solomon's Temple piece as well. Um, so it's interesting that I've picked out this one as well as one that I like with the peacocks and the other crazy birds. It says, Margaret Jane Ledbetter worked on this at Mrs. Corbett's school, Sando, in the year of our Lord, 1846. So, as many of them were a school piece. So I'd love to do that one. Um, I haven't printed this one off completely because my printer was, um, it was fed up really. Um, so I can't tell you what size it is, but from memory, she's quite a big girl. So this is gonna be a considered start, not just a whim. Although you'd think that about a long dog, wouldn't you? The considered start, it's not just a whim. Now this, this is my favourite. Um, this is the 1864 EF sampler. Now I'm sure I've seen this, but when I googled it, I couldn't find anything other than from this particular magazine. Um, this one here. So you've got these beautiful bright alphabets and this cow. That is my absolute favourite. I might have to start a cow wall. I'm going to have a Welsh wall and a cow wall. And then a couple of chickens down here. Jaunty little uh, deer. 
florals, butterflies, a bird. There's literally nothing you could want more. And I think that is absolutely glorious. Have I got a stitch count? Can I see the stitch count on this one? Because I bet this one's quite big as well. Here we go. 222 by 278, so not as big as I thought she was going to be, but okay, I can just do it without showing any of the, the chart there. There's a close-up of the cow with the milkmaid going about her business. There. I love that. I love that. It reminds me actually of the... Um, Riffle de Soir one that I was, um, I've got started at the moment in one of my whips, um, De La Plagne, can't remember her first name, don't know, there we go, so there's another shot of that one. So if you haven't seen this CD-ROM and you're able to, I would seriously recommend getting it. Um, I can't remember if I said to you, but everything's in PDF format. Each magazine is one PDF document, so you don't need any specific special software to open it or anything. It will open up, provided you've got you know, a fairly bog standard computer that can open PDFs. Um, you'll have no trouble with it. It doesn't require anything, anything difficult at all. And what would it be to put, buy those charts? £15 each, probably. Um, for big sampler charts. So in terms of value for money, I don't think you can beat it. Sorry. Now that I've started talking all week again, um, it starts to go for my throat. I've got two other samplers down here to show you. Um, what with it being sampler September and all. Um, ones that I've stitched. One of them actually is what got me into stitching samplers and a bit more interested in samplers and it's a fairly recent one um it's the hands across the sea one that jane uh, jane marshall that that he released for the australian bushfires and i'd had samplers you know to stitch and i'd never really gotten into looking at them particularly and i stitched this one and that was it i was hooked so here she is, this is Jane Marshall, this is one that I framed myself, um, again no glass, slightly darker fabric than was called for, the colours aren't what was called for either, um, they are an ode to the colours that were called for but they were just what I liked and what I thought looked nice on my, on my fabric. So that one was stitched at the beginning of this year and that really was what told me that I wanted to do more samplers and so I've started loads since then. <laughs> I finished a couple as well but I've started loads. Um, it's funny isn't it how one one just grabs you and then the other one that I've got finished and framed up here, now this one was professionally framed so it does have glass on it, um, is Harriet Elizabeth Coe by With Thy Needle and Thread. I stitched this one um, when Farm Girl did her stitch along. Um, she picked this one out as a chart that she really, really liked. And then it got delayed because the chart, I don't know if it went out of print, but it became hard to get, um, probably because everybody wanted to do it. Um, but I'd already picked, I'd already had my chart. I already had it in my, in my stash. So I wanted to do this one. This is on 28 count um, fabric. I couldn't tell you what color it is. Um, the original was, called for was 30 count something but I can't again I can't remember what the original colour was and I'll try and make it so that you're not going to get the glare but I'm not sure we've got some bright bright conditions at the moment here so you've got lots and lots of eyelet stitches in the um, alphabet and this band here originally was um, eyelet stitches as well, but I did some crosses. I was sick to the back teeth of eyelet stitches by then, and so I wasn't going to do them. 
but I loved the colours. Absolutely loved the colours. There you go. You can just about see reflected the mess that I've got surrounding me of stuff to show you. Um, I should really have spent a little bit extra and gone for the non-reflective glass. Um, they did offer it to me, but um, at the time I didn't want to, to go for it. And actually on the wall, it's not too much of a problem. Um, I could always just un take the tape off the back and take the glass out, which I may do at some point in the future, but that is Harry Elizabeth Co. I have done a couple of other samplers, but I'll maybe save those for later on in the month. So that's where we get to with, with samplers. As I said, lots of people had asked me about dyeing um, and about what I do and how I get the colours and the, the textures and just in general saying that they liked the pieces that I dyed. So part of my haul this week was um, some walnut crystals. Now, I've got lots of brown liquids behind here. So this is where it's going to get a bit sciencey. Not very, but a bit. I've got lots of brown liquids and jars around here. So I've got to make sure I get the right drink and not the dye. These are black walnut crystals. And... I bought them from eBay and I was looking for um, some just to try and they had a 10 gram pack that was about two pounds or they had a 50 gram pack that was about four pounds and I thought well, 10 grams won't go very far so I went for the 50 gram pack. I've now got enough walnut crystals to last me for the rest of my life I should think. You do get quite a lot. They come from the black walnut tree or the shells of the um, walnuts from the black walnut tree and I've had a little read about it. There's a long process of um, sort of treating the shells and um, turning it into this kind of crystal dye. So you don't have to do any of that. You just buy the dye. And in order to make it, another sample here. I'd be worried if it looked like that. Um, the recipe that I found was a cup of water with a quarter of a teaspoon of walnut crystals and you just mix them together um, it takes you can use warm water or you can use cold water but i would give it a good sort of 20 minutes just to settle and make sure there's no um, crystals left in there because you will get bad dye spots if you if you do that and so that then is your dye. Now I would say that this is the easiest dye aside from um, coffee tea dyeing. It doesn't require any mordant. So a mordant is something that you add to your dyeing process to make sure that the dye sticks to the fabric. So if you've done dyeing before or read anything about dyeing you might um, have seen where people have used salt or soda ash um, or had to put vinegar or something in them. That's effectively doing the job of making the um, dye stick to the fabric. This is this doesn't need it. Um, and walnut stain is used in lots and lots of sort of industries. You use it on wood, in woodworking. You can use it on paper. Um, if you do any paper crafting, you'll have probably seen walnut stain in little spray bottles that you can use for antiquing um, elements and things like that. So I made the dye. And then I wanted to try some different techniques to um, to see what it did. And it's a really, really easy dye. It takes very quickly. It um, gives you some really nice results. And as I said, you don't have to do anything with it after you've dyed it. I didn't even rinse mine out. I just hung them up to dry. So, um, oh, excuse me. The reason I've just grabbed this actually, take it out of the packet, this is picked to this plus fawn. And of the picture this plus fabrics, I would say that fawn, maybe oaken, is about the colour. 
that you get with the the walnut stain so the first thing I did was I put some in a little spray bottle now this is one um, a misting bottle so you're getting as fine a mist as possible without the drips but what I did was I put it flat on I did it on my garden table um, on a bit of tin foil actually and I sprayed it and I started to get drips from the drip from the bottle but I liked them so I carried on so this is my first technique with a spray bottle now I use the fabric dry um, because you can use this technique on already stitched pieces if you're brave enough if you want to dull it down a little bit make it more antique -y, you can spray onto already stitched pieces so these are all 32 count white zweigart from the same fat quarter so this is my science experiment i cut it into four and i treated each fourth each fourth differently so this was what i got from just spraying but the piece but the fabric was horizontal and i let the drips fall onto it if i was doing this on a um a project and I didn't want those drips, I would consider hanging it up and spraying it sort of on a washing line rather than um, letting those drips fall on because I might not want those drips, but I might just want that kind of antiquing spray. So as I said, this was white. What you could do once you've let it dry is go over it again. So you'd have some areas where you've got almost like a double stain so that they'd be darker and you'd get a, a different depth of color. The back, The back looks like that. So you don't have, let's see if I can turn it over there. You don't have the color. The mist hasn't seeped through onto the back, but you've still got those splotches. So any of you that like to do um, the Rendale ones, you know, that have got the, um, the brown splotches. If you've got the chart, but not the fabric, then you could always do your own. But I really like that. In fact, I really like both sides of that. And so that's technique number one. So that's just spraying it straight onto um, dry fabric. Excuse my uh, iron line down the middle of that one. Okay, technique number two was very low immersion. So what I did with this one was I put it into a, um, a dish scrunched it up a little bit and then poured the dye onto it and then I just sort of poked it with my finger very technical I poked it with my finger just one thing walnut stain is a stain it will stain anything it doesn't require a mordant so you can't just wash it out um, so clothes fingers just be careful with those so this is the very low immersion technique I really like this one as well um, so one of the things when you're using dry fabric sorry one of the things when you're using dry fabric is you tend to get much more um stark patination stark it's more than mottling isn't it you you get much more stark lines when you use the fabric dry compared to when you use the fabric wet and also this is the back or well, this is the bit that didn't have as much dye on it and again I really like both sides and it's a lovely brown this has actually become my favorite dye my favorite one so we've had spraying and we've had low immersion just dribble it on the next two I did jar dyeing so I used exactly that recipe and I put it into two jars now the first jar I used was bigger um, the fabric didn't have to be scrunched up as much I added a bit more water and I didn't leave it in for so long so what you end up with is kind of like a lighter touch and 
this would be a lovely fabric for samplers. Now, when I say this dye takes really well, that is probably, if it's five minutes in the jar, that's all it was. So it's really quick. And if you're used to dyeing with RIT, um, RIT can sometimes take a bit longer to dye with. But and that's the back of that one. But this is really quick. It takes really well. So if you use a bigger jar and you don't scrunch it so much, you should get more, um, not such stark mottling. You should still get mottling, but you're not going to get those very, very deep lines that you would get if you use a small jar and you scrunch it really, really well. Both of these are done wet. This one and the next piece were done wet. So that's the one that didn't have very much time in the jar and was very loosely scrunched in a big jar. This one I gave a bit more time to in a smaller jar. So we've got a darker dye overall, but also we've got a lot more obvious mottling. So what I've got now is four pieces of fabric that I've used the same dye the same recipe but four different techniques so for those of you who've asked me about dyeing my first suggestion would be just to have a go and if you don't want to buy expensive dyes buy some walnut crystals for four pounds or in fact less than four pounds you can have a lot of good fun and you can really see what works um, you can obviously just go and buy some plain white cotton, just some cotton sheeting, or from a charity shop, grab a, a bed sheet, something like that, something you've got old at home. If, as long as it's cotton, you should be able to see how these techniques kind of work. So basically, if you use dry cotton, you're gonna get much more stark results than if you use wet cotton or wet fabric. So dry, more stark than wet. If you use less water so more dye in a very low immersion in a tray you're going to get much more um, stark mottling if you scrunch it small in a small jar you're going to get more stark than if you scrunch it less in a big jar those are the sort of variables that seem to really make a difference so whether the fabric's wet or dry the size of the dyeing jar obviously the dyeing technique the tiny you leave it in for the fabric will also make a difference. So whether you're using linen or even weave. So there's, there's quite a few variables, but it's really worth giving it a go. Um, if you get a piece that you don't like, then you can just dye it again. Get something darker, buy a, a, a darker dye and, and give it another go. And if it doesn't suit the project that you want it for, then it'll suit another one. Um, when you leave them to dry, one quick tip is leave them to dry either hanging on an error or hanging on the washing line from the top okay so put your, your pegs up there if you loop it over like that you can get a line so as the dye settles out as it dries you can get a line so i've managed to wreck a couple of pieces of fabric by um putting them over an error, uh, particularly when I've used a very dark dye and so the dye settles out on the lines of the error and the same is true for um, a radiator, a nearly wrecked a radiator as well doing that because <laughs> the dye dripped out a bit. Um, so that's a really easy technique, you don't need to rinse it out, just dip it, see what it looks like, if you like it, dry it, just have a go. Um, so that was my little experiment yesterday. I was trying to only change one variable at a time but um, I'm really pleased with what I came up with and I, I can't wait to stitch on some of those things. So last thing then, haul. I have got weird haul. My haul is a bit weird this week um, but I'll show you what I've got. It's all part of the grand plan. I have plans. So my first haul was um, something that I bought because Nisi Lin has got this lovely little red 
tool carrier in the background in her videos and I really admire it and someone was selling a couple of them on Stash I know but I have seen them on um, in Hobbycraft they're not quite as heavy as the ones I've got but they're more like the not quite balsa wood but that type of wood that they sell for you to paint your own so the first one I bought and I painted it black this one's had two coats it just needs a bit of wax so this is going to be for my Halloween pieces for displaying my Halloween things and then I, had, I bought another one from her from the same woman the fluff on it and so I painted it red Niecy's is red so I painted mine red as you can see this has only had one coat so it's got a couple of bits where I've missed missed it off um, and then I'll give that a sand and this is going to be my Christmassy one oops I touched to it my Christmassy one but also probably maybe spring as well spring or summer I'm pretty sure I can make this either or so really pleased with that I'm going to pop little um, bits and bobs in it and then I can decorate the handles and just have that on my my mantelpiece my second bit of haul told you it's weird is some ground walnut shells from Internet Reptile. These are the same things that you pay twice the price for if you buy them for stuffing pill and pillows, things like that. So there we go. That's a little pin pillow. And if you listen to it, you can hear it's stuffed with walnut crystals. They're really good for pins, they sharpen the pins. And that, including postage, I think cost me about £13. Whereas if you buy it specifically for needlework and for making pin pillows, um, you hardly get anything and you pay a lot more. They're also really good for um, stuffing with fibre fill as well. I've got something to show you that I've stuffed with both. So you don't need as much, but you still get that real nice density that's sometimes really hard to get with um, with fibre fill. Okay, um, some other little things. Some of you might have seen, excuse me, thinking, on Instagram. Um, I meant to show you these last week actually. I went to Highclere Castle with my mum, which is Downton Abbey. Now my mum was 70 this year and what I decided to do was to, instead of buying her something, every month we were going to try and do something. So I had booked uh, a spa, um, visit to Highclere Castle, Downton Abbey. Um, I also had a visit to Gifford Circus booked, um, which is a non-animal circus. Um, well, they've got horses, but nothing more than that. Um, and my mum really loves Downton Abbey. I've never actually watched it. I've been to Downton Abbey twice. I've been to the actual place twice and I've never really seen it apart from the film. But she loves it. It's a beautiful place to go. If you get the chance, you definitely should. Um, we actually saw, it's the, it's the family seat of um, Lord and Lady Carnarvon. So you might have heard of um, Lord Carnarvon before. He was um, one of the people who discovered the tomb of Tutankhamun. Um, not the current Lord Carnarvon, because he's died now, but a long time ago. Um, well, 20s. Um, and we actually saw the current Lady Carnarvon. I was disappointed she didn't have a tiara on. But, um, oh, I'll tell you one thing. We were at, we were down in the in the Egypt exhibition, and um, there was a group of guys come behind us, and obviously you have to move along, you have to do the uh, the COVID conga, non touching two meters, shuffle along slow COVID conga, and this guy was telling his his mate, oh do you know the difference between a tiara and a diadem? And I was like ears pricked up. I'm like oh, I don't know the difference between a tiara and a diadem, so I had to sort of hang back while he was telling his mate in a very kind of animated fashion the difference between a tiara and a diadem. Anyway, apparently, I have looked this up and it's sort of true, um, a tiara doesn't go all the way around, whereas the diadem does, usually. So apparently all tiaras are diadems, but not all diadems are tiaras. Very interesting, in fact, that I learned. Anyway, so what did I buy after that little interlude? Um, 
I bought some buttons. I bought some terracotta buttons. And <laughs> if it'll focus. So that's the first one. Robin. More of an American Robin, I think, than a British Robin, but I like him. And then similar one but from a distance. And then a flutterby. And then just a couple of sort of almost William Morris inspired ones there. Another one. Beautiful. I really like those, so I can't wait to use those on my projects. Um, I do have some normal haul, some charts. Um, the first one, and these are mostly from um, like stash and load sites, so not big money, was Lizzie Kate Think Autumn. Now I have never stitched a Lizzie Kate and this just really grabbed my attention. really liked it. It says, um, I bought it sort of as a discontinued one, it wasn't expensive, um, but the, the owner of it did say it was discontinued, but I don't know quite what's happening with Lizzie Kate, who's got all their charts and whether they've got all of them so whether you could still find that one I don't know I think one two three stitch have got quite a few for sale and and local needleworks will still have them around the place now this one is a new release and there's another one to this actually a pumpkin one which I really like too um, this is by Lila studio and that is on picture this plus ancient and I think I might be able to squeeze that on the bottom of Jack's Bash um, because I love that fabric but I've also got a piece of murky that hasn't got that much dark on it so it might do it might go on there as well. Um, I also, and this isn't something I've bought but I swapped, I had um, one of the Animal Crackers series, Theodore. Um, let me see if I can get him. And here he is. This is Theodore, and he's stuffed. Just a little bit of uh, free Dalmatian fancy floss. He is stuffed with a combination of um, fiberfill and walnut crystals. And so, I'm so pleased with him. He looks lovely. There we go. So there's Theodore, and he's got his little bag and in his little bag he's just got a little tiny cotton reel, wooden cotton reel. I said I love wooden, wooden cotton reels. Um, and then in the back he's got, that must be painful, a pair of scissors that don't seem to want to come out but I'll leave them in there. And his little bag sitting on his shoulder. So anyway, I have got um, a stitchy friend called Lynn who has got some of the other Animal Crackers series and I said would she like to swap? Um, so I sent her Theodore and she sent me Scarlet. So it looks like a type of a Boston Terrier or something like that. Um, apparently the dress goes on forever. Good, yeah, we'll get on with that. So, same idea, sort of like a little scissor keep in the back there. But looking forward to stitching that one, and I'll stitch that on the same fabric as I stitched Theodore on, which is, I believe, a 32 count, just like raw, natural, like that. And then the other thing I bought, again from Slash Unload, was a lady called Bev who was selling her four uh, Little House Needleworks ABCs. So you've got Spring, Summer, Autumn and Winter. Now she actually posted her 
design on one of the Facebook groups that I'm on and she's actually stitched them all together on one piece and they look really really lovely um, so if that's not something you've thought of before um, then it does work it really really looks nice um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to stitch mine individually and I'm going to make it into a sort of a hanger um, with a sort of a board backing to it so it'll have all four will have the same board backing and then they'll hang in front of them and what I'm going to use to hang them off are these now I went into our local um, antique shops a bit strong junk shops a bit mean somewhere in between you know one of those places that you think oh, really people people want that and then other things you think oh amazing this these beautiful knobs are door handles wooden door handles from um it says on there the 19, 1900s but they definitely you can imagine them definitely being older so what i'm going to do is this is going to be my hanger i'll take the label off i won't bother now um this is going to be my hanger and i'm going to make it because these are nice and thin i'm going to make it so that they hang from there and I'll make it so you can switch them out really easily and so you'll have the doorknob like that with the back in and then the hanger hanging down I get these crazy ideas but I think it'll work and they're so tactile they're really tactile I think of all the people have uh, used these although that's not what we like to think of these days is it when people have used doorknobs I'll give them a clean so that finishes me up for this week um i didn't think i'd have that much to talk to you about but i seem to have managed probably nearly an hour by the time i've edited these two videos together so i hope the little edit in the middle makes sense and i don't end up repeating myself too badly um we've got full school next week by wednesday we'll have all the pupils in so that'll be interesting um anyway i hope you stay well I hope you enjoy your stitching, hope you get plenty of stitching time and I'll see you soon but in a couple of weeks now. Alright, take care, bye bye.